Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this absolutely beautiful day here on the Bethesda campus. Um, our lecture today is devoted to genome-wide association studies, and as you all know, these kinds of studies really help us separate genetic variations uh, that are biologically insignificant from those that do produce some sort of change that might ultimately be detrimental or advantageous to a particular individual. And study of these variations are also critical <coughs> to identify identifying what genes are responsible for a particular genetic or genomic disorder, as you heard about during last week's lecture by Lynn Jordy. There's also a much more practical reason to study these genetic variations, particularly the single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, that give rise to all of those subtle differences between each and every one of us in this hall, uh, since a very thorough understanding of these variations might provide a way for us to know in advance how well someone will respond to a particular mm -hmm. drug or to a particular treatment regimen. And we'll hear much more about the pharmacogenomic implications of having this kind of knowledge in next week's lecture uh, in this hall by Howard McLeod. Uh, this week, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Karen Mulkey, who will be presenting today's lecture on genome-wide association studies. Uh, Dr. Mulkey is an NHGRI alumna, uh, having done her postdoctoral work in Francis Collins' lab, where she used genome-wide approaches to localize diabetes uh, susceptibility genes. She is currently an associate professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of North Carolina, a member of the Carolina Center for Genome Sciences, and a member of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC. Uh, her lab studies complex traits with um, complex inheritance patterns using many of the approaches that she will be describing to you today to study conditions such as type 2 diabetes and obesity. As always, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today, Karen, and so please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Mulkey back to the NIH campus. Okay. All, right. All right. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, and. Um, no, no difference. It's always a pleasure to be here. So as Andy said, I'm going to be talking today about uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, and these are especially uh, relevant for uh, complex traits. Oh, and I have uh, no uh, relevant financial relationships to describe. So complex traits are uh, traits that have both genetic and environmental contributions to them. There may be many genetic factors, many environmental factors, and these factors may interact. That is, that there's not necessarily a single gene responsible for these traits. Uh, and some of the genetic factors have rather subtle effects. As we investigate genome-wide association studies, these are especially good at identifying common genetic factors that may be responsible for common variation in complex traits. And by common factors, I mean that when looking at a stretch of DNA sequence uh, and looking at several copies of this stretch of DNA sequence, of course, many of the alleles are, many of the nucleotides are identical between those sequences, but sometimes there are differences. For example, here's a T, but in some copies of the sequence, there's an A. That's a relatively common variant. Three out of ten times in that representation, it's an A allele, so an allele frequency of 30 percent. There are also DNA variants that are uh, less common or rare. So for example, uh, over later in the sequence, there's only one copy of a G allele where there may be a hundred or a thousand. Uh, other copies of that are a C allele. When we think about the genetic architecture of genes influencing common complex traits, uh, we can consider the different power of uh, uh, various approaches to identify um, the, very, the underlying genetic variation. If we consider the frequency of the variance, here, up here being more common variants, and common is often defined as a frequency of an allele greater than about 5 percent. Uh, moving on down to the very rare alleles, those that might be present in only one person or one family. Uh, and considering the effect of the allele, how um, strongly that uh, variant acts to cause disease or to increase risk to disease. 
Um, and so a very strong effect allele um, shown high on the y-axis compared to ones that have a um, relatively modest effect uh, low on this uh, axis. So genome-wide association studies are especially well suited to identifying common variants uh, implicated in common diseases. In contrast to, say, the rare alleles causing Mendelian disease that may were more easily identified using uh, linkage approaches or uh, candidate gene approaches, there have been rel relatively few examples of high-effect common variants that influence uh, common diseases. And as genomic technologies advance, we're moving more from the common variants into the lower frequency variants. Uh, and so lower frequencies, maybe from 5 percent down to about a half a percent, uh, and as sequencing uh, technologies develop and um, more individuals are sequenced, then we're moving into the identifying more of the rare variants uh, that will be um, identified to play a role in uh, both common and uh, Mendelian type disorders. So today, as we talk about genome-wide associations, I'm going to talk first about what the goal of these studies are, how the studies are performed, what can be learned from the associated regions that are identified by the studies, and then what the findings tell us about disease. So genome-wide association studies, the first ones were done seven years ago now, perhaps. Uh, there became um, uh, many more done uh, sort of in the five, three years ago and um, continuing on today. The benefits of doing a genome-wide association study compared to classical approaches such as linkage analysis uh, or candidate gene genetic uh, association studies were that uh, genome-wide association studies are more powerful than linkage to identify common and low penetrant uh, variants and provide a better resolution than linkage so that the variants identified are closer to the underlying causal. Uh, genes and or variants than linkage analysis approaches. And they can be performed in an unbiased approach. There's no need to select candidate genes and know the underlying biology ahead of time. Uh, these can be used to discover completely novel pathways involved in a disease or trait that were not previously known. Now why were they only started several years ago? There was a requirement to perform a genome-wide association study. We need to know the catalog of human genetic variants, so the genome need be sequenced and genetic variants across the genome identified. Uh, there's a need for low-cost, accurate methods of genotyping, and technology advances have uh, enabled this to, be, um, this to be possible, so now hundreds of thousands or millions of variants can be identified uh, in a single re reaction. Uh, need large studies of people, large numbers of informative samples, uh, and along the way, efficient statistical design and analysis methods to handle the uh, large number of variants being analyzed. So the goals of a genome-wide association study are to test a large proportion of the common single nucleotide genetic variants uh, for association with a disease or variation in a uh, quantitative trait. Uh, and doing all this without having to have any prior hypothesis of how the genes may act or what their functions might be. I'll talk through many of the steps in a genome-wide association study. So starting with uh, ascertainment and collection of the individuals, the samples, the methods for performing genotyping, steps of quality control uh, using that uh, genotyping data. Um, some of the methods of statistical analysis uh, using this data and the importance of uh, uh, replication. So as we start uh, thinking about the phenotype that is being uh, studied, this can either be a disease or a quantitative trait, so a disease such as uh, type 2 diabetes or prostate cancer, or it could be a quantitative trait. Uh, height, cholesterol levels, um, something that's not discrete but uh, uh, has a continuous distribution of uh, phenotype across the individuals. Disease could be rare or could be common, uh, although the 
uh, common disorders are perhaps more appropriate for a genome-wide association study. Quantitative traits have the advantage of being easy to measure, uh, things like weight and height. Some of them require uh, uh, careful um, approaches to measurement and getting an accurate measurement. Uh, genome-wide association studies can also be formed with, uh, performed using traits such as gene expression level of all of the genes across the, uh, the genome. The accuracy with which a phenotype is assigned is an important uh, step in uh, analysis. The more well-defined the phenotype is, the more likely one will be able to identify the genetic variants responsible for it. The more heterogeneous the phenotype, if it's really a mixture of many different causes uh, that create that disease, then uh, uh, it'll be, those will be sort of mixed together and harder to identify the underlying causes. When selecting the uh, individuals to perform uh, analysis, the strategy, so one strategy is to perform a case control analysis, meaning ascertaining cases affected with disease and then also ascertaining controls uh, who do not have disease. Another approach would be to do a population survey, uh, collect many, many individuals across the population and then uh, determine which ones of those are affected with disease. Using the population survey, you'll have a smaller proportion of individuals affected with the disease, uh, but they may be more representative of that disease in the population than if you perform a, uh, ascertain the cases that are uh, severely affected with disease uh, that might be less representative, although they might uh, lead to greater possibility of identifying the genetic variants responsible for them. So in a case control analysis, uh, the methods to or the approaches used to define the case are uh, relevant and important to consider when interpreting the results of a case control association study. So were cases defined with extreme phenotype? Were they, uh, uh, how were they uh, collected? Is there some um, special subset of phenotype that may be uh, especially enriched in that particular set of cases. Uh, similarly with controls, are the controls selected to be uh, random members of the population that are not yet affected with disease, but then some of them, if it's an adult onset disorder, perhaps will become affected with the disease next month or next year, are uh, perhaps less good controls uh, when seeking to have uh, a greater difference, although, um, uh, so consideration of these um, approaches is important for uh, how those results are interpreted. So potential criteria that one could use when selecting cases would be to choose individuals that are more severely affected with uh, the disease. These might be individuals that have a greater genetic load then and so provide a greater opportunity to identify the underlying genetic factors. One could require other family members to have the disease. This is uh, another, more evidence of a genetic factor responsible as opposed to um, more of an environmental contribution. Choosing for an adult onset disorder, choosing individuals with a younger age of disease onset uh, also could enrich for genetic factors. When considering criteria for selecting controls, could enrich the genetic effect by choosing individuals with a lower risk of disease rather than population-based samples. It's important to keep the ancestry of the controls and the cases <clears throat> matched as well as possible and to try to match the controls to cases based on age, sex, and other demographic factors that may uh, influence disease. To show a bit of an example about uh, matched ancestry, if the cases are collected from the population but have different uh, underlying ancestry represented here by different shadings of the uh, symbols here, so maybe solid filled symbols and, and uh, these two different categories. If that different ancestry is differently represented, if the proportions of those are differently represented between the cases and the controls, and there are genetic factors or genetic variants that are more common within some of those subsets than others, then those genetic variants may appear to be associated with disease when truly they are associated with uh, being part of that subpopulation. 
when performing uh, an association study in a uh, set of samples that have not previously been analyzed uh, genetically, you may have inadequate ancestry information prior to performing the genotyping. Uh, ascertaining individuals from a particular area, you may uh, assume that the ancestry is uh, similar between individuals. After performing genotyping with hundreds of thousands of markers across the genome, one can look at the uh, frequency of different alleles and identify uh, perhaps subsets of individuals that are, uh, create subpopulations within uh, the sets of cases and controls. So this uh, subpopulations is the, uh, that I've been talking about. Another word for this is population stratification. Uh, so the issue being that population stratification can produce uh, false positive association results in case control uh, studies. Uh, in addition, individuals that are uh, cryptically related, that you don't know are related, but uh, have uh, um, that are, um, say, cousins or um, something not collected, not known in the uh, collection of the individuals, uh, can enrich for particular alleles uh, within samples, and that can also uh, create a false positive association. Ways to account for or avoid uh, stratification and relatedness, one is to uh, perform genomic control. So this is a correction that's an average um, uh, evaluates the sort of the average excess association identified and uh, adjusts the results of the association study by this average measure to sort of um, alter the threshold that you use to define what a significant result is. Another approach is to use the allele frequencies of uh, variants across the genome to identify uh, principal components of say subpopulations or of substructure within the samples and then include those uh, uh, pop principal components of substructure as covariates in the analysis to account or adjust for them. Another approach to avoid population stratification would be to perform a family-based study design uh, where instead of selecting cases and controls, the association uh, analysis is performed within families and considering the uh, relationships between the individuals. Uh, on a per, if with given a set uh, um, genotyping budget, uh, however, there's reduced power uh, for identifying variants when individuals are uh, related and uh, part of those families. So the genotyping process, now genotyping panels are available with uh, as few as 10,000 uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, as many as 5 million SNPs now. Two main companies provide um, a number of fixed content panels available, meaning that uh, the, the genotyping arrays or chips are available with set um, SNPs that, that are being evaluated on them. The approaches used to select the SNPs for these panels, uh, some of them are random SNPs, some of them are selected to be haplotype tag SNPs, and Lynn Jordy talked about this, and I'll show a slide about this uh, uh, as well. Some of the variants or some of the nucleotides chosen to be on these panels uh, are not nucleotides that vary, that have different alleles in the population, but for which the intensity of the signal uh, differs because of a copy number variation. Uh, and some of the arrays now are, uh, that are now available have fixed content, but the user is allowed to add on an additional 10,000, 50,000 single nucleotide variants. So if you were to perform a genome-wide association study today, you may choose a panel and then say, oh, but these particular variants are missing from that panel. Perhaps you know of some less common or rare variants that are not on the panel or some particular uh, um, uh, functional variants or variants that you think really play a role, those could be added onto the panel. Uh, higher density genotyping, uh, higher density SNPs in special regions of interest could be added uh, onto those uh, arrays. So when I talk about selecting haplotype 
uh, tag SNPs. I have an example uh, shown here. So uh, in this example, now there are four copies of a particular chromosome. Uh, again, most of the nucleotides are the same. This is representing uh, three single nucleotide variants in this region. When combined together with uh, variants that are both upstream and downstream of this, uh, the, uh, the variants can be shown represented as haplotypes. And uh, the, given the history of human populations and the um, non-random recombination events that have occurred during human demographic history, there are clusters or sets of uh, SNPs that are being inherited together in most members of the population. And so selecting SNPs that are representative of variation uh, of other SNPs allows a more efficient, um, um, uh, fewer SNPs to be genotyped to represent a larger proportion of the variation. So for example, these haplotypes of uh, 20 variants can be represented by just choosing three SNPs uh, within this set. And there are other variants that could be chosen as well. This is sort of an example. Uh, 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 TCTC variant here could also easily be represented by this variant here, CTCT. But the set of three variants represents the uh, variation present. So this also means that when interpreting the results of an association study, although a single variant might be described, reported in a paper, uh, say this variant is described as showing strong evidence of association, it's important to remember that there are other variants located nearby that are in linkage disequilibrium with that variant that are inherited together in the same pattern as that variant that may, that would also show uh, similar or identical evidence of association with that trait. So I'll talk through a few of the methods of allelic discrimination that are used uh, in these genome-wide uh, genome genotyping panels. Uh, one of them is this uh, Illumina Infinium assay. Uh, in the Illumina assay, uh, DNA is amplified to generate uh, larger amounts of DNA, and then the uh, DNA is captured on oligonucleotides that are uh, bound to uh, bead arrays. An allele-specific uh, extension or a mini-sequencing uh, assay is uh, then performed. So here is the uh, genomic DNA target. It's being uh, hybridizing to uh, a sequence that is on an oligo that's bound to a bead, and a sequencing reaction happens so that uh, if the allele provided is a perfect match, then the polymerase can continue on with that sequencing reaction. If there is a mismatch of the end nucleotide, then no uh, continuing sequencing reaction can occur. There are a few different um, forms of this uh, assay that Illumina provides. They have an Infinium-1 assay and an uh, Infinium-2 assay. Uh, in this case, there are two different uh, bead types used to represent that, uh, a single SNP uh, and one color of um, um, detector to, that, that is a detectable label that's used. In this form, a single base extension reaction uh, happens, so a single bead type is used and two different colors of, uh, of detector are uh, involved. So when Illumina describes the number of uh, SNPs or, um, uh, available on a panel and the number of, say, custom designed SNPs that could be added to a panel, they talk about bead types because some SNPs are uh, assayed well with a single bead type, and some SNPs are assayed better with two bead types. Okay. Affymetrics has a genotyping platform <clears throat> called their gene chip array. In this strategy, the genomic DNA is uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of reduced genomic complexity by performing restriction enzyme digestion and size selection of the fragments. Uh, adapters added, amplification steps, uh, fragmentation and labeling, and the allelic discrimination happens uh, based on hybridization of one allele uh, to sets of oligos on the array. 
So in their uh, gene chip probe array, there are millions of copies of a specific oligo uh, probe bound. So in a, given, uh, in a given region, here are DNA probes in sort of one part of the array, and there are multiple copies of this uh, same sequence with the same variant allele present. A given SNP can be represented by many different probes. Say the SNP uh, allele, the variant allele may be in the center of an uh, oligonucleotide, uh, and there could be f as many as the four different sequences represented on the probe, representing all four possible uh, alleles that could be bound there. And then the, the variant could be offset by a nucleotide or two, not precisely in the middle, but moved over, or the, uh, the probe could be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. With time, uh, the choice of which, um, which probes are the most efficient at discriminating between the two alleles uh, improves, and that's what allows uh, Affymetrics to uh, add on additional variants to be able to uh, fit more variants onto an array uh, and allows the discrimination to be um, optimized for uh, given variants. Affymetrics also has a newer platform. They're uh, an axiom array. In this case, uh, the DNA is um, amplified and fragmented into, say, 25 to 125 base pair uh, fragments enzymatically. And then the fragmented amplicons loaded onto the array to uh, hybridize to oligos. And after uh, selection, some uh, a, solu oops, a solution of random uh, nine-mer oligos that are labeled are hybridized to the array, and they're hybridized such that if the uh, alleles match, then a ligation reaction can be performed. And so the discrimination, the allelic discrimination is based on ligation, uh, which requires the alleles of the adjacent nucleotides to be, um, to be matched and to hybridize well. And that provides greater um, allelic discrimination, a little bit better than, say, hybridization uh, would, hap would, would provide. And then the um, labels that are present are stained and uh, imaged. So here's a representation of what some of the sort of coverage of common variants is for a set of arrays that are available. Uh, and these are a little bit some of the older arrays. And so coverage is calculated by looking at the set, some defined set of common variants that are present. And when you interpret what, uh, um, what the coverage is of a particular array, you want to consider uh, what that set of variants is. Often HapMap variants will be defined or 1,000 genomes variants. The more sequencing that happens, the more variants that are identified. So knowing what that reference set is is, is valuable. And then looking at the, uh, the linkage disequilibrium between a given variant and the other variants that are present in that set uh, is used to estimate what that coverage is for the given uh, chips. And the coverage is going to differ based on the population of the individuals uh, uh, being assayed because allele frequencies differ and linkage disequilibrium relationships differ between uh, populations. Um, so some of the newer arrays that have more variants present on them do a better job, have higher coverage of common variants than, say, some of the older uh, arrays. Now, the most recent generation of SNP arrays that are uh, available are improving coverage of the lower frequency variants. So in the initial arrays, we're uh, covering the variants, say, um, of five, frequencies of 5% and greater. Now the, uh, the frequencies covered are moving down into the, say, less common ranges. So here's a slide from, um, uh, from Illumina. One of the newer arrays that they have available is specifically chosen for the Chinese population. So this particular uh, chip was designed to select variants based on individuals uh, uh, from Chinese ancestry. And so they showed that the coverage, uh, 
uh, on the y-axis here of variance with, with an allele frequency greater than 5 percent uh, uh, is, um, is, is sort of shown here on this particular array compared to one of their other uh, genome-wide association arrays. So here's a more general array, and this is the one that's chosen to uh, be specific for the Chinese population. And you can see that they're also improving the coverage of their of the less frequent variants, those with a minor allele frequency greater than 2.5 uh, percent, increases with this specific chip. To be fair, here's also a, a, a slide showing one example of an array from Affymetrix, uh, and they too, in their uh, latest uh, arrays that are available, show that they are. Uh, well, they have good coverage of the common variants. They are also moving into trying to have improved coverage of the less common variants in this uh, little bit lower frequency, sort of that 2 to 5 percent uh, allele frequency range. Okay, so genotyping of samples, cases and controls, or members of the population is performed. Uh, genotyping data comes back. Uh, there are a number of quality control steps that are important to, uh, to do in a genome-wide association or pr pr prior to performing the association analysis. One is to look for and detect poor quality samples. So samples that had a success rate less than some level, maybe at the 95 percent of the SNPs are uh, successful. The more SNPs that fail, the more that the SNPs that succeed are called into question as to perhaps be generating inaccurate uh, genotypes. So if, um, if most of the samples are working very, very well and some of them are not as well, then it could be that heterozygotes are being miscalled as homozygotes for particular alleles. And so identifying and excluding poor quality uh, samples is, is um, valuable. An excess of heterozygous genotypes might suggest that those two DNA, that a DNA sample is really a mixture of uh, two DNA samples. One can use the genotype data to evaluate whether any sample switches have happened in that process from when the DNA sample was collected from the individuals and then that, uh, say, that tube or the tube of blood was collected, it was processed into DNA, it probably changed hands many times, it was moved from a tube onto a plate and a plate that was then genotyped. And that whole process, uh, sample, sample switches can happen, and one way to identify whether that's happened is to uh, look at the sex of the individual based on markers on the X and Y chromosomes uh, and evaluate whether it matches the uh, sex expected in that uh, individual. If DNA samples are around a lab for uh, a while, then particular alleles that are, are particular genotypes known from one set of genotyping reactions can be compared to those. Uh, done on another, you know, with another assay to see whether, at another time point, to see whether any sample switches have happened uh, in the intervening time. One can use the genetic data to look for unexpected related individuals. So again, when analyzing a cohort or a population for the uh, sample for the first time, one can use pairwise comparisons of genotype similarity and look for um, say unexpected duplicates might turn out to be monozygotic twins uh, or people who participated in the sample collection more than once uh, with different identifiers. Uh, and you can also use the allele frequencies of variants across the genome to look for individuals who have ancestry that may be a little bit different from the rest of the sample and then consider that and either exclude them or account for that, those differences when performing the later analysis. In addition to looking for poor quality samples, uh, one can look for poor quality SNPs. So uh, shown here are a few examples of raw data of genotyping of um, uh, sets of, set of individuals. So shown over on the left here, now the signal intensity of one marker, they said the X marker, we'll call it the A allele, signal intensity of another marker, it's labeled the Y marker, let's call it the C allele. So, uh, the, this is a lovely looking uh, marker where the allele intensity is very high on the A axis for this set of samples and relatively low on the C axis, so these would be the AA homozygotes. These uh, similarly are very high on the um, C allele axis, these would be the CC 
uh, genotype, and these would be the heterozygotes. It's an ideal genotyping plot. When doing um, hundreds and thousands and millions of markers, software is used to assign the genotypes to various clusters. It can occasionally, um, the software might not detect the, that these two clusters are distinct and might call them together as heterozygotes, uh, so erroneously assigning uh, heterozygote genotypes to these individuals, sort of try and look, look for uh, cases when that happens and fix them or exclude those markers. Some assays for given SNPs don't work all that well, and there's not much discrimination, or the discrimination is not clean between the clusters. And so the individuals that are especially close between these two clusters may be more likely to be miscalled with an incorrect genotype. And those genotypes can either be excluded or, um, uh, or it's at least most helpful to recognize the marker and perhaps exclude the entire marker uh, to avoid having uh, errors in the data that might lead to false positive or false negative uh, associations. Other ways to, so that often happens at the genotyping level, at the, the individuals performing the genotyping analysis are those who are looking at that raw data, uh, uh, evaluating some of those uh, characteristics. One can also detect SNPs that are of poor quality by looking for uh, a genotyping success rate less than 95%. So now this is a SNP that worked in less than 95% of the samples. And it's sort of an arbitrary threshold, but a commonly used one. Might suggest that there's some problem in that assay that uh, the, uh, perhaps it's not discriminating well between the clusters. Perhaps the genotypes that continue to exist are inaccurate, and therefore excluding the marker would be a, uh, more prudent. Often these analyses are done using um, a small percentage of samples are duplicated, are present twice within the set of samples being genotyped. So then the genotypes from those duplicate samples can be compared. And finding mismatches or discrepancies between those identical samples is a, a, a bad characteristic for a SNP. Uh, I'd want to exclude those uh, particular markers. You can also do a test for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, looking for the uh, proport expected proportions of genotype uh, uh, or genotype frequencies are not consistent with the observed allele frequencies. This also suggests that the marker perhaps has a, uh, has a problem, that the, um, perhaps heterozygotes are more often being called homozygotes incorrectly. And so um, a statistical test can be used to identify that kind of an error. If there are related individuals within samples, uh, such as a mom, dad, and a child uh, trios, then one can look for Mendelian inheritance of alleles from the parents to the, uh, to the child. Some groups will add uh, additional quality control samples to their uh, genotyping, to their, to their um, sets of samples to allow this kind of um, uh, SNP error to be detected. And then it's also important that if, say, a set of cases are going to be compared to a set of controls, that the genotyping be done as similarly as possible between those two groups. If the, if the cases are genotyped entirely separately from the controls, then it's possible that there is different allele missingness or that there's different accuracy of the calls between the cases and the controls. And this could lead to uh, false positive associations. So it's uh, important to try to intermingle the cases and controls as much as possible to um, account for any differences in uh, plates or arrays or any of the technical steps in doing the genotyping to um, detect uh, any sort of potential uh, errors. Okay, so once the genotype data is cleaned, that meaning that the you know, poor quality samples, poor quality SNPs have been uh, removed, then one can go test for association. So uh, in a case control study, this is now looking for differences between the cases and controls in terms of their uh, allele frequency, genotype uh, frequency of things. So for example, one could perform a uh, test for trend, looking at the, the uh, frequencies between those different sets. So look at the counts of individuals in these, uh, with different genotypes within the cases and controls. 
it's valuable if there are covariates that uh, are also associated with disease. So if the disease prevalence increases with age or if it's more common in males than females, then covariates representing all of these um, factors should be included in the analysis to account for them uh, to improve the uh, opportunity for the genetic variance contribution to uh, disease risk or the quantitative trait to be identified. Often tests are done with um, looking for an additive effect of the alleles on the trait, meaning that uh, having one allele has an effect and having two alleles has more of an effect. Uh, other um, tests can be done looking for evidence of dominant or recessive uh, models or, or uh, however the additional number of tests performed in doing an analysis like this would need to be considered when deciding what the threshold of significance uh, of the overall results at the end are. So for example, in a case control study, uh, when, looking, uh, when looking for the effect of an allele on risk of, develop, of developing disease, one could calculate an odds ratio. So if these are uh, counts of individuals, uh, cases and controls that have uh, and counts of the alleles A and C represented uh, in those individuals, and one can calculate an odds ratio as the um, odds of having a C allele given case status over the odds of having a C allele given control status, and uh, this would form an odds ratio. And so a value that is uh, greater than one shows uh, increased risk of uh, disease for that particular allele, and an odds ratio that's significantly less than one is uh, evidence of decreased risk of uh, disease. When uh, performing association analysis on a uh, genome-wide scale, many, many tests are done. So if uh, 300,000 to 5 million SNPs are being analyzed, then one would want to correct for that number of multiple tests when defining what a significant result is and what a sort of spurious chance result uh, could be. One approach for doing this is to take a commonly used threshold of significance, say 5 percent, so 1 in 20 times, you might see a result, uh, a difference between cases and controls that is at this level of significance, and divide that by the number of statistical tests being performed. So com a commonly used threshold assumes that the number of common variants being tested across the population, and this was designed based on a, a Caucasian population, is approximately a million tests. And so taking a p-value threshold of 0.05, dividing it by a million, creates a new threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus eighth. So this is a commonly used threshold for de declaring that a particular result is uh, significant and not, um, not likely to have occurred by chance. Achieving a threshold like this requires uh, either a large effect of that or uh, um, uh, of that particular variant uh, or a large sample size to detect a uh, more modest effect. A question. Just a quick question. So, so is there any preference to which multiple testing procedure is used? So, so different approaches are used to define the question is, are there different uh, strategies? One could use a false discovery rate as opposed to this, a Bonferroni correction for multiple tests. Different approaches are used. I would say that uh, declaring a threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus 8 is, is very commonly used uh, uh, within the literature, although um, people will argue whether that's an appropriate threshold uh, to be used. and often. Uh, there are signals that do not reach that threshold that uh, it's due to uh, limited power and when sample size increases in the next round of a study, then those variants become significant and um, so it, it is a valuable thing to consider. So I show here an example of what results would look like from an association uh, test. This is from uh, uh, an early test for type 2 diabetes association between uh, comparing not quite 1,200 type 2 diabetes cases to not quite 1,200 
uh, normal glucose tolerant controls. This is work of the uh, fusion study. And the results shown here are for the genome with uh, the chromosomes lined up end to end. So chromosome 1 on the left all the way down to uh, chromosome 22 and then the X chromosome with each dot representing a single nucleotide variant that was tested for uh, association. And this analysis was done using uh, logistic regression uh, with an additive model and adjusting for age, um, sex, and birth province even within Finland to account for uh, potential stratification. And then on the y-axis is this minus log 10 of the p-value. So uh, a p-value threshold of uh, 0.05 would be about there. So you can see that when doing this many tests, that's uh, not an appropriate threshold for defining what's uh, significant. There are many, many variants that uh, uh, have a p-value smaller than that threshold. The threshold for accounting for the number of tests done here uh, would be uh, in the sort of 10 to the minus 7th or that 10 to the minus 8th range. You'll notice that the maximum scale here is 6, so none of the results from this initial study reached uh, that threshold of genome-wide significance. As we, that makes it difficult to figure out what variants might represent true positives. At the time that this study was done, and before, sort of the before genome-wide association studies were available, there were three variants, or three loci, that had a well-established role in uh, genetic contribution to uh, type 2 diabetes. And so we looked for the location of those variants within this data. So one of them was at the TCF7L2 locus. So it was gratifying to see that within the top 10 SNPs of this association analysis that those uh, variants were uh, present that suggested that, the, um, uh, that it would be possible to be identifying genetic uh, factors. Another of the variants was at the uh, PPAR gamma locus. This is maybe now the top 300 variants. And another of the variants was uh, with an established role was around 3,000th on the list of uh, 300,000 variants uh, analyzed. One way that the, uh, to evaluate whether there's an excess of significant results uh, at, a, at a given threshold is to plot the uh, p-values that result from the test of association against the p-values from a uniform distribution. So shown here on the x-axis is uh, minus log 10 of uh, a uniform distribution and on the y-axis minus log 10 of the p-value from the test of association. So uh, there's a, a black line showing sort of the expected. Uh, right along the edge here, and the blue dots that are, um, uh, represent the data that I just showed you. So you can see that there's a sort of a slight uh, movement off of this line, but very much falls along the line. So uh, this is good from the perspective of there's no excess of uh, associations that might represent population stratification or some sort of excess relatedness within the individuals. Um, but it's bad from the perspective of there are no variants that showed uh, strongly significant excess uh, evidence of association in the true analysis compared to uh, the uniform distribution. If one was doing an association analysis in a population that had uh, evidence of uh, uh, substructure or stratification, then a plot, uh, a similar plot, might show that the variants um, in these dark blue dots show an excess significance sort of all the way uh, through, the, um, through the scale. If the, uh, this population stratification is adjusted for, then the p-values that result from the association test are more in line with uh, that expected uh, distribution. And so correcting for population stratification can reduce the um, excess result, excess associations that are false positives that are not due to true genetic signals. So performing an association analysis and uh, uh, doing all that work and not identifying significant results 
uh, a frequent next step is to try to gain statistical power by increasing sample size. Larger sample sizes will have a greater possibility of identifying genetic factors that have uh, a more modest effect. So the, frequent, the common way that this is performed is that each group does uh, their own genome-wide association analysis, and then the data from uh, several studies is combined together by performing a meta-analysis of the results for uh, each genetic variant. Now, potential issues of performing a meta-analysis across studies, uh, one is that different genotyping platforms may be used and different analysis strategies might have been used in the beginning, uh, and also that the definition of cases and controls and, uh, may differ. So there's some heterogeneity that's introduced by uh, the fact that different studies are performed in different ways. Generally, the uh, strategy that has been applied is that larger sample size is more valuable and more powerful uh, in the face of these, uh, uh, say, differences in um, sample collection, and so um, results need to be taken with, um, considered with some caution that about what heterogeneity might underlie them, but that generally larger sample size is identifying uh, additional more variants. To address the uh, uh, different genotyping platforms that may be used by different groups, the uh, st several strategies for imputing or predicting the missing genetic variants between platforms uh, have been developed. So in imputation, one might have in your study sample uh, genetic variants typed at say a position here, position here, position here, but that the other genetic variants in the intervening re regions were not typed. They were not selected for that genotyping uh, platform. The study samples can be compared to um, some sort of a dense uh, genotyping uh, platform uh, or dense set of genotypes. So HapMap is a commonly used set of uh, variants. So this is um, on sort of uh, samples that were chosen to try to be representative of some particular populations uh, that were analyzed at a much denser set of genetic variants. Now, more recently, the Thousand Genomes Project has uh, generated data at an even denser set of variants. And so one could take the uh, genotyping data from a particular study and impute uh, the variants from the Thousand Genomes Project and fill in many more of the uh, genetic variants. So instead of analyzing, say, 500,000 variants that were uh, um, genotyped on the array, one could analyze two, two and a half million variants present that are um, on some of these um, reference panels. So the strategy for um, doing imputation is that um, a, a probabilistic search for um, mosaics of chromosomes um, that match each individual uh, is performed. So, for example, the uh, top uh, ha uh, chromosome from this individual uh, is represented by uh, this um, haplotype within the reference panel. The lower uh, chromosome of this uh, study individual is uh, best represented by a mosaic of, say, one uh, portion of a chromosome and, and another portion someplace else, suggesting, right, that this individual has a, that the um, portions of these two different haplotypes, a recombination event has occurred sometime uh, in the past. So then the genotypes can be sort of filled in uh, from those uh, uh, phased chromosomes. There are several different approaches to performing imputation, and often they, uh, the analysis provides some evidence of the likelihood that filling in that genotype was correct. And so thresholds for quality can be used, and uh, if a variant is um, really part of a chromosome that's been seen many, many times in exactly that same uh, set of variants, and has been seen in many copies of that haplotype, you might have a lot of confidence filling in 
the intervening uh, 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 genotypes, whereas if it's a region of lots of recombination and it's unclear exactly which haplotypes match best, then uh, the filled-in genotypes may have uh, less uh, accuracy, less likely to be correct. And so uh, analysis can be performed and sort of choose a threshold and not include genotypes that are imputed with a low likelihood of accuracy. The advantage of doing imputation is that it allows the many different genotyping platforms, studies done on these different genotyping platforms to be uh, combined together. So here's an example of um, one of the arrays that say perhaps genotyped these particular markers, whereas a different array uh, genotyped these particular markers. And when both, are, both um, sets of data were used to impute markers from the HapMap project, uh, the markers shown in blue were able to be analyzed in both studies. So while the overlap between um, the sets of data available from one platform or the other was, you know, the, the directly genotyped markers that were shared was relatively small, the total number of markers that were able to be analyzed uh, was a much larger, is a much larger set. Imputation doesn't require that the variants be perfectly in linkage disequilibrium with the variants that are tested, right? It's a haplotype-based approach. And so it's possible to identify variants that have uh, a different frequency than the variants that were typed. So there are examples, at least in the early stages, where uh, variants were identified to show association only when imputation was done, that none of the markers on the genotyping panel uh, themselves uh, showed association. So in this particular plot, this is a zoomed in region of a portion of uh, chromosome 9 and the, uh, with some genes shown below and the minus log 10 of p-value for LDL cholesterol levels uh, shown on the y-axis. And the dots that are shown in red are the markers that were directly genotyped on the particular genotyping array. And the dots shown in blue were the ones that were imputed based on using the genotypes from the AFI array and imputing the variants uh, present in the HapMap uh, sample. And so you can see that none of the red dots showed uh, strong evidence of association in this region. However, uh, at least one of the blue dots uh, gets up into a more significant uh, p-value uh, showing evidence of association. And this is the low-density low density lipoprotein receptor locus for um, associated with LDL cholesterol, a result that was known prior to uh, this kind of analysis, but goes to show that the uh, imputing can identify variants that were um, not present on the genotyping panel. So here shown is an example of uh, the structure of a meta-analysis where um, seven different groups got together. Each one performed their own uh, genome-wide association analysis using a uh, shared analysis plan for what method to use and what model to use and what covariates to use. And then a meta-analysis of those seven studies uh, was performed. And the top SNPs, the most strongly associated SNPs from that study, or representative ones of, the, uh, of those results, were selected to follow up in additional samples. So some studies, some cohorts have uh, genome-wide genotypes available. Some do not and, and are, uh, but are able to genotype, say, 50 SNPs to go follow up on results. And so in this particular example, um, around uh, uh, 40 to 60 SNPs were selected and different groups in these uh, replication cohorts went and genotyped those variants uh, separately using a different uh, genotyping platform. And then the data from those replication cohorts was uh, analyzed to determine which of the initial variants showed uh, significant evidence of association. So in this particular example, the genome-wide association analysis was done in a, around 20,000 individuals, and then some of the top variants were followed up in around 20,000 individuals. The results of that particular analysis are shown here. Now, there are three 
genome-wide association plots because there were three phenotypes uh, analyzed with that set of data, uh, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglyceride uh, levels, all phenotypes measured in the same people. Once the genotype data is uh, available, then looking at the range of all phenotypes uh, present is um, relatively quick. So shown here are three genome-wide association plots and three uh, these quantile quantile plots. So let me zoom in and show a portion of, uh, of one of these. So here's a portion of the uh, genome-wide association plot. These are often called Manhattan plots because the uh, tall buildings show up out of the uh, background of, uh, of uh, shorter buildings there. The, uh, in this analysis, this is sort of the, not the first round of genome-wide association studies for these traits, but um, a later round. So they show the results on this QQ plot here. The, um, the gray line represents the expectation if none of the variants show uh, significant uh, association. And this is uh, shown now with a 95 percent confidence interval on that line. So black represents uh, the set of all variants uh, identified in this particular uh, trait, LDL. When removing the variants that were uh, known previously, then uh, the, the blue symbols are representative of the data being reported in this particular study. So they still showed an excess of significant results. There are still novel signals, evidence of association being identified. If they remove the uh, effects of those variants, you can see that there's still some little bit of excess uh, association present, but none of the variants in uh, particular sh reached the uh, genome-wide significant level. So meta-analysis is useful and uh, follow-up and replication of uh, initial association results, especially ones that don't uh, reach genome-wide significance levels. Uh, yet can allow for increased power and increased opportunity to um, identify novel signals associated with a disease or a trait. When performing meta-analysis, however, one has to be concerned about heterogeneity between the studies. So one example uh, to demonstrate this, uh, when the Welcome Trust Case Control Consortium performed a genome-wide association of type 2 diabetes. They showed strong evidence of association of variants at the FTO locus with type 2 diabetes. However, uh, a couple other studies that were doing association analyses of type 2 diabetes at the same time didn't really see evidence of association with FTO at all. It turns out that the Welcome Trust cases were more obese than the controls uh, in that study, whereas the other diabetes studies, their case control um, selection had been more balanced with respect to uh, body mass index, body size. So the identification of this source of heterogeneity between the studies led to identification of FTO as a gene that plays a strong role in uh, obesity. Some of that data is shown here. This is a uh, plot showing odds ratios and their 95 percent uh, confidence interval uh, of the odds ratio. So the x-axis is odds ratio, 1.0 is, would mean that there's um, no increased risk uh, uh, or decreased risk of a given variant here at the FTO at the A allele of this marker representing the FTO locus. Uh, the initial set of welcome trust cases of type 2 diabetes showed a strong um, show a strong odds uh, for uh, obesity. Here are the, um, well, the controls that were used in that analysis. So when you see the controls used in the type 2 diabetes analysis, so you can see the effect on obesity is larger in these type 2 diabetes cases than in those uh, type 2 diabetes controls. That's why it looked like uh, evidence of association with type 2 diabetes at first. And they go and collected when they went in and collected other sets of um, cases, other sets of controls, and then valuably uh, samples that were 
uh, from population-based collections, so not disease status uh, ascertainments, and evaluated the effect of this particular allele. You can see that it consistently shows an increased risk with uh, obesity. So this and odds ratio is 1.3, and the, uh, the confidence interval around it is quite narrow because it's a very large sample size, and so this was the sort of definitive evidence showing that these variants are associated with uh, obesity. Okay, so genome-wide association studies uh, have been performed now for uh, at least 237 traits. This is a, a results cataloged uh, by the NHGRI in a catalog of uh, genome-wide association uh, uh, studies. The, uh, the slide shows the various chromosomes and with some colored dots representing positions of some of these loci. And uh, most recently, there's sort of last summary here is about 1,449 published genome-wide association uh, uh, signals at, with p-values less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8, uh, representing uh, 237 traits. So many genome-wide association studies uh, have been performed, and uh, many, many loci have been identified where genetic factors are associated with the trait or disease. As would be expected, uh, more loci are found with larger sample sizes. So in this uh, recent review, the, uh, a number of different results are summarized with the number of cases uh, shown here on the x-axis, 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000, and the number of uh, genome-wide association hits or signals uh, represented on the y-axis at 1, 10, and 100, and the different symbols representing different studies that were uh, performed of different sample sizes. And here's a subset of uh, case control studies that were done for Crohn's disease, uh, uh, um, different uh, various studies. And you can see that generally the uh, larger the sample size, the, number, the larger the number of cases, then the more genome-wide association hits are identified, showing that um, many signals exist and that the, um, the effects for many of them are relatively modest and that large sample sizes are needed to identify them. So let's look at some of the examples of types of uh, uh, results that are identified in genome-wide association studies. I'm going to look at a few uh, plots of particular loci, so zooming in on the genome uh, to particular regions. So here's a portion of uh, chromosome 19, and about uh, 400 kilobases are shown on the x-axis, each of these representing uh, genes in this gene-dense uh, region. And p-value test of association over here uh, is, uh, has a strongest signal here with a p-value better than um, 1 times 10 to the minus 25th. This is replicating a known association, one that's been known for a very long time, of a variant at the ApoE locus uh, associated with LDL uh, cholesterol levels. Now this is not the variant itself that is, uh, uh, has been shown sort of most, most strongly to play a uh, functional role at this locus, but it's inherited in a similar pattern. This example also uh, lets me highlight that when results, so in this particular case, uh, this variant is close enough to a, a known gene that this gene might be the one highlighted in a report of a genome-wide association study. However, if this was a novel signal, then, the, you know, the evidence, uh, the decision about what gene label to use in a report uh, might be a little bit arbitrary, might be a little bit driven by what the biology of those underlying genes might be. But it's important to know that when reading a paper of a genome-wide association uh, study, that the gene label assigned is often just the nearest gene to uh, that SNP that happens to be the top signal and might not be the, the, um, a gene that is contributing to uh, variation uh, at that locus. Also, even though a single gene might be provided in that label, 
there could be genetic variants that are affecting more than one gene at a given locus, uh, that, that, you know, that there's true causal underlying variants, uh, that there's multiple of them, and that they could be affecting different uh, genes at that locus. So um, interpret with caution. Okay, so then some signals that are identified uh, can be novel signals. In this particular case, the strongest evidence of association was found within an intron of a gene, meaning that um, shown down here, these uh, little tiny boxes representing exons here, and all of the variants that show the strongest evidence of association here are localized within an intron. So perhaps underlying causal variants are uh, not shown on the plot, but are in linkage to equilibrium with variants in the plot and could be uh, playing a uh, role in the protein sequence, or perhaps underlying variants are influencing uh, gene expression of this gene or of some other gene nearby. Some novel signals are found um, at, at a distance from uh, known protein coding genes. So these, these are identifying uh, possibly novel biology or possibly novel mechanisms. So variants that are found at a distance to protein coding genes perhaps are affecting uh, other sequences in the genome, RNA sequences, non-protein coding genes that may be uh, present. Not all of these are annotated uh, in the genome yet. Or they could be regulatory effects, you know, having uh, regulatory influence uh, say, is as enhancers or repressors of transcription of uh, genes that are hundreds uh, of kilobases away. More and more, um, multiple signals of association are identified in a given region. This makes sense with what's known about uh, genetic variation and allelic heterogeneity for Mendelian disorders. There's more than one way to influence uh, a gene. There's more than one way to uh, alter a gene. So there's often more than one common variant or signal that uh, can play a role in uh, uh, association uh, at a given locus. So shown here are uh, two separate, it really is the same data shown twice, but it is colored based on the relationship of the variants to one another. So there are really two signals here, one that's localized quite close uh, to uh, this particular, the promoter of this particular gene, and another signal that is uh, independent, independently inherited uh, from the, uh, the signal that is, is located um, tens of kilobases upstream of this particular locus. One way to look for uh, independent signals is to uh, include a given uh, single nucleotide polymorphism variant in a regression analysis to adjust away the effect of one variant and then see what the results of the other variants are in the region. So in this particular case, if you know, each dot here is representing the evidence of association uh, with the trait, if one were to perform this test and include one of these variants uh, in that test of association, at this locus, the signals are independent. And so by including this evidence of association, the test of any of these other variants would essentially go away and show uh, no evidence of association. However, these variants, uh, the association of these variants is, uh, remains unaffected uh, by that um, other signal. So this is really strong evidence of independent signals influencing association. Now, there may be more uh, variants that are not necessarily independent of each other. There could be two causal functional variants uh, that share some haplotypes but not all haplotypes with each other. And so uh, when going into the functional biology, trying to figure out what the mechanisms are, what the underlying variants are, um, it's not just independent signals but the multiple signals that might be present that might uh, help indicate how, that, how these DNA variants are leading to changes in gene expression or function leading to uh, disease. Here's evidence of association that uh, um, shows that you can obtain different uh, results in uh, different uh, populations. 
and that populations that are older and that have more evidence of uh, recombination events that have narrower regions of linkage disequilibrium can provide greater resolution to uh, the, the signal that can show a narrower region of association uh, than uh, in other populations. So shown here are some uh, evidence of association uh, uh, with height uh, for a set of variants across a region. And then shown below are the uh, linkage disequilibrium, pairwise linkage disequilibrium plots for sets of variants in this region from uh, uh, the CEU HapMap population, HapMap sample, and the YRI HapMap sample. And you can see that this um, evidence of association, which is from uh, 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 populations of uh, European ancestry samples, um, shows evidence of association sort of across, uh, across this uh, region, uh, and that there's a relatively wide um, uh, linkage disequilibrium block in, in this region, whereas in the YRI samples, there's a more narrow sets of these variants are more inherited together. These are more inherited together, but they're not. These and these are, uh, show less association with each other. The signal from Caucasian uh, uh, sample was uh, quite broad. The signal in African-American uh, individuals was strong in this region, but was not strong in this region. So sh suggesting that the more likely location of a potentially functional underlying variant was restricted to down in this region and not in this one. In this particular case, the variant that was, uh, showed the stronger association in the African Americans was also one that had been shown previously to have an effect on uh, gene expression of one of the nearby uh, genes, perhaps providing some support for um, it having a functional role. The more genome-wide association studies that are done with a range of traits, the more that the same variants and the same genes are being identified as associated with uh, two or more traits. Sometimes these uh, signals are being identified that are associated with traits that uh, one can um, um, uh, recognize what the underlying uh, mechanism uh, might be. Sometimes the relationship and the different dis diseases that are, or traits that are, show evidence of association helps provide some biological clues as to what those uh, pathways uh, might be that are responsible for a particular trait. So uh, there are variants that are being identified, for example, for both uh, diabetes and cancer. And um, in at least one case, the same DNA variant was associated with increased risk of prostate cancer and decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. Examples like this are suggesting perhaps the role of cell cycle uh, genes and that variants can uh, end up having different sorts of effects. Looking at the collections of uh, traits and associations might help us understand what the driving uh, uh, biology is underlying a signal and which association is coming, you know, sort of as a result of uh, that initial uh, trait. So in this analysis of genome-wide association uh, signals, I, the, the, um, the authors took the set of SNPs that had shown evidence of association with a trait or disease and then uh, looked at annotation classes of where those variants were uh, found uh, in, the, uh, in the genome and looked at uh, annotation classes such as uh, non-synonymous sites, uh, regions around promoters, regions in introns, regions that are intergenic, and compared a randomly selected sets of variants on genome-wide association panels to those that showed evidence of association and look to see uh, whether there's an excess of variants in particular classes that had been found to be associated with disease. So in this particular analysis, um, here's the odds ratio of one. So anything crossing an odds ratio of one is not uh, significant at the uh, uh, five percent level, but these classes here of, of non-synonymous variants uh, and promoter regions, uh, as with, with 
at uh, sort of 1 kb and 5 kb uh, definitions all showed uh, that the trade associated SNPs were overrepresented uh, in these classes compared to uh, just uh, random variants on the uh, genome wide arrays. And even though there are more variants present in introns and you know, many variants identified in introns and intergenic regions that show evidence of association, there are also many more variants uh, on, the, on the arrays that are, uh, have these characteristics. So uh, taken together, the uh, genome-wide associated variants are being um, uh, identified that explain some of the population variation uh, for uh, the various traits. Shown here is a subset of uh, traits, a partial table uh, from a, a recent review, and uh, it shows a set of traits and the heritability from pedigree studies uh, expected for these uh, particular traits. So some traits are more um, highly heritable uh, than others, uh, and the, they show in comparison the, um, the genome-wide association uh, signal hits, the ones that are sort of defined at genome-wide significance, and what proportion of the variation they are uh, explaining of the um, uh, of this uh, heritability. And so we're approximately, in many cases, looking at, uh, say, about 10 uh, percent of the uh, heritability is explained by the genome-wide association hits. Now analyses are being done to evaluate what the effect of all common SNPs might be, not just the ones that have uh, reached that threshold to, to define significance, but the ones that maybe have not quite reached it yet, uh, that with greater sample size and more power might reach it in the future um, to estimate what the heritability might be of all uh, SNPs that are being analyzed. Uh, so you can see, for example, that, that the uh, heritability that may be attributed to such common SNPs uh, could increase uh, uh, a fair bit. Still not likely to be representing all of the variation uh, that may be present. We're only Genome-wide association studies are largely restricted to uh, some of the common variants, and so this suggests that there are other uh, uh, genetic factors that are playing a role in heritability. The use of the, this information to predict uh, disease is really dependent on uh, um, the disease and the uh, heritability, and I should also say that in this particular case uh, with type 1 diabetes, there were variants known prior to the they included some variants known prior to the GWAS era uh, that were, had very strong effect uh, when looking at the, uh, that heritability number. One way that uh, people are characterizing uh, uh, individuals uh, is based on the number of risk alleles that they have. Uh, you could see some uh, evidence of differences in, in groups of individuals. So well. Uh, the variants might not be per well predicted for a given person. One can count up. So in this particular case, there were um, more than eight uh, SNPs available that had shown evidence of association. So for each individual that counted up, how many height increasing alleles did that person have? And then grouped them. So here's a block of individuals that had fewer than eight or equal to eight uh, height increasing alleles and plotted their average height and compared it to, uh, in these other regions, the uh, individuals that had at least 16 height increasing alleles and their, uh, plotted their average height. And so between the uh, uh, individuals that had the lowest and the highest number of uh, height increasing alleles, there is a uh, few centimeter difference in uh, how tall they are. However, these are uh, most individuals fall in the middle of this uh, plot. These are common SNPs. Uh, and uh, the individual predictability of uh, the variance is relatively low. The value in clinical translation, then, of these genome-wide association studies uh, largely uh, is starting with the novel biological insights. These hundreds, more than a thousand uh, signals identified in the past few years provides uh, hundreds and thousands of um, novel biology uh, to 
biological signals to go investigate and evaluate, determine what the role of uh, those variants and those genes uh, plays in uh, disease, which would then in time lead to uh, clinical advances, uh, particular drugs or uh, biomarkers that represent the um, uh, disease better, potentially leading towards prevention. There may be some improved measures of uh, individual uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, approaches, and I think you'll learn more about those, especially with respect to uh, drug development and drug response uh, next week. So in summary, when performing genome-wide association studies, it's important, or interpreting them, it's important to pay attention to the design and quality control. Large sample sizes are needed to identify uh, signals with modest effects. There are more than 1,400 signals and counting across the genome-wide association studies done to date. Uh, and that finding any signal doesn't immediately uh, provide information on the underlying biology or clinical utility, but sets off lots of uh, follow-up analyses that can uh, lead to these discoveries. And the time to changes in medical care based on some of these results might be years, but the uh, uh, biology is really uh, advancing uh, um, quickly. As we progress with genome-wide association studies, more and more loci are being identified. Larger meta-analyses are being done. Groups are gathering together more and more um, sets of samples. There's deeper follow-up of genome-wide association signals, so groups are uh, creating custom arrays of not just 50 variants to follow up, but thousands of variants to follow up to identify uh, additional signals. Population-specific uh, panels are being developed to increase the uh, range of genetic variants that can be analyzed in a given study. More diverse populations are being used to identify variants. Um, other types of sequence variants, not just single nucleotide variants, are being uh, incorporated. Analyses are being done with multiple traits and looking at the relationships between uh, those traits. And these are beginning to allow gene-gene and gene-environment uh, analyses and interactions to be uh, evaluated. And finally, the uh, data are generating sort of evidence and, and spawning much future analysis to figure out the molecular and biological mechanisms underlying the signals. So thank you very much for your attention.